I just finished playing in Austin's biggest ever Lorcana tournament, and I'm really excited to talk about the top eight decks. So as fans of the channel know, we don't do a ton of meta coverage and deck tech here, but having just finished this event and having watched a lot of these top decks being piloted, I was really excited to talk about some of them and to highlight the top eight because there was a really diverse group and it was really great to see. Now the prize pool in this tournament was two boxes of Lorcana cards and $200 in singles credit that was spread among the top eight. So it wasn't quite a 1K, but if you do the market value of current box prices, it actually comes kind of close. This drew 52 people from the Austin area and some as far as Dallas, uh, which is a three hour drive to play this event. The tournament format was five rounds, then cut to the top eight. After the quarterfinals, the top four decided to split. So out of the top eight, we know the top four and then those that finished five through eight. This is what the top eight looked like, an incredible amount of diversity, which was really exciting to see. The only deck we see two of is the Steel Song decks, but to be honest, they're very different lists. When we go through them, you'll see that they play very differently. So really we didn't have two of anything in the top eight, which was just fantastic. Now, I didn't get to see all of these in action, so I won't be able to talk about all of these decks equally, but there are some that I'm very excited to talk about, and I will save my deck, which I absolutely love, until the very end. Before I start, big shout out to Game Castle for a fantastic, well-organized, and community-oriented event. Absolutely love it. Keep up the good work. To start off, you know it, you love it, it's Ruby Amethyst. This deck was piloted by Joshua Lindsay and finished in the five through eight slot. There were a lot of Ruby Amethyst decks at the uh, at the event today, and this one rose above the rest of them to make it into the top eight. Uh, Joshua, sorry I didn't get to see many of your games, but I did talk to some of your opponents and I know you piloted this deck very well. This is a Ruby Amethyst deck, it's control, so we all know kind of what it's trying to do. We do see some interesting changes from some of the other lists that we've seen though. This deck does run the baby Elsa, the shift target for Elsa Spirit of Winter. It does run two Zeus, and I have to say that with Kuzco's current rising popularity, Zeus is a great option to take out Kuzco's in one shot, unexpectedly. I also want to mention that this list only runs one mirror, uh, which is fewer than, than we've seen in a lot of these other lists, and two poisoned apples in the mix. Um, I really want to ask Joshua about this. Josh, if you watch this video, leave uh, a note in the comments about uh, about these poisoned apples. I assume that this apple is used more for the Banish a Princess uh, effect more than the Exert effect. Um, we do see a lot of princesses being played. In Sapphire, we're seeing more uh, Jasmine Queens uh, being played. Also in a Singer deck, if you can take out the Aerial Singer early, you can avoid having a five song uh, sung on turn four. Ruby Amethyst remains a mainstay in the tournament scene. Next up in five through eight, it's another deck that we've seen growing in popularity over the last few weeks. This is a Steel Song deck piloted by Ivan Montalvo. And Ivan really showed us how this deck is, is meant to be played. I asked him about it afterwards and he said it's a pretty standard list. One thing he did want to highlight was the two Kronks which he threw in there, which he said really performed in this tournament. They helped with challenging cards such as Maui, Ursula, Stitch Variants, even Tinkerbells, um, basically taking out some of those big bodies. He did say that after today he's eager to tinker with the list a little bit and maybe include some early pressure with some baby Stitches, little Simbas, and maybe a Rockstar Stitch for some card draw. To make room for that, he'll probably remove Han's 13th in line. Anyway, Ivan piloted this deck very well, and I'm eager to see what he does with it in the near future after today's experience. Here's another top eight deck built and piloted by Bobby Blake. All right, we need to talk about something. I was privileged to play Bobby throughout the day, and I found out afterwards, thanks to one of our subscribers, that Bobby is actually a two-time world Kaijudo champion. For those who don't know, Kaijudo is another card game that was designed by Steve Warner and Ryan Miller, the designers of Lorcana. And so Bobby actually knows the designers and came onto Lorcana because of his connection with them. Um, so it was a real privilege, uh, I found out after the fact, to get to play him. Um, and I'm really excited to see what he does in Lorcana because he was an absolute master at Kaijudo. So this is the list that he brought to the tournament. Um, I was really excited to see this list. Um, I don't feel like we see these color combinations a ton right now in the top eight, but I think it's rising in popularity a bit. Um, it performed very well throughout the day. Um, I did ask Bobby about it afterwards and, and a couple notes he said. You know, one, he said in retrospect, he thinks it might perform better with the Aerial Song package over the Rockstar Stitch package um, and to focus more on control uh, than on tempo. Uh, there were a few clunky hands he had with Stitch Rockstars, Aladdin, Maleficence, and no small drops, but it did very well against Ruby Amethyst, which was what the deck was designed to do, um, and so he achieved that goal. Um, and one thing he did highlight was uh, LeFou and Rockstar Stitch is amazing. There's a lot of fun plays you can make with that combo, um, so it's something that he had quite a bit of fun with, and um, yeah. Overall, I, I like this list. I was really excited to see it crack the top eight, and um, I'm really excited to see what Bobby does in the Lorcano world. So, Bobby, it was a privilege playing you, and um, thanks for taking it easy on me. Next in the top eight, it's another color combo that we know and love. It's Sapphire Steel. Now, Thomas Parker piloted this list. He did a fantastic job, and I asked him after the tournament for any thoughts on the deck, and he gave me some gold. So rather than distill it, I'm gonna read some of what he sent me. Some folks tend to think of the Sapphire Steel deck as a mid-range or even control deck, but it's really best thought of as a combo deck. 
Your goal in each game is to A, play enough defense not to get run out of the game early, then B, accelerate your ink into a C, five or six drop on turn four so that you can D, sing a whole new world with fully open ink on five. Then hopefully dump some of those resources onto the board and do it again on turn six if you draw a second one. He admitted the numbers on the list look a bit funky, but some of them should be considered overall packages instead of threes and fours. For example, um, he thinks of four quills, three mickeys, and three tiny tacticians as his 10 accelerators. Quill is your most reliable, but mickey on three can also play one of your fives on four. And tink is your tertiary backup that can serve as a huge deterrent threat, as a shift target for big tank. Even if you don't have giant tink in hand, simply playing a tiny tink on three makes a lot of decks think twice about questing. Similarly, the three hook and four Eric serve as your first line of defense against the various aggro decks. There's nothing special about the numbers other than he wanted seven anti-aggro threats and likes Eric more right now. One thing he said, it's almost certainly wrong not to have a fourth let it go in here. Um, not sure why he made the decision, but something to fix. Robin Hood was a card he was skeptical of after adding a pair and then eventually four, but it was super needed against Amber decks packing You Have Forgotten Me because it draws a third card after we drop it on turn four from Quill, and so it protects a whole new world there. And he said this line and came up surprisingly often. And given that it has evasive on your turn, it also doubles its help against the increasingly common Pascals, Green Tinks, Genies, etc. Beast Hardheaded, this card almost always feels like the worst five to six drop, except he's the critical card in the Ruby Amethyst matchup. From Maleficent Uninvited, he said, a lot of folks he feels are making mistakes playing Aurora in this slot, and he did for a while too. And while it's nice to protect the bells, it often just feels better to plop down this gigantic threat instead, and now they have to deal with both. As far as matchup goes, he really liked the deck against Ruby Amethyst. The Amber Steel matchup felt close to even, but varied widely depending on which version. Against versions packing lanterns and a higher volume of cheaper threats, it can really struggle, which is what knocked him out of the top eight. As far as the green variant matchups, he said this also varies pretty widely. The fast ones can wreck this list if he doesn't get Hook or Eric early, and also a Tinkerbell or grab your swords. The slower ones like Emerald Steel and Emerald Amethyst are much better to deal with. Emerald Sapphire feels like its worst matchup because it's so fast and we'll cover that list later. And one fun honorable mention and that's Taka. Uh, that's a card that we don't see run terribly often. Um, he realized this morning he didn't have a fourth Maleficent so was trying to decide what to run in the slot. Was thinking maybe something big to help fight the increasing stat lines that Amber decks are throwing around. So maybe Cerberus or Kronk. But then he threw in Taka. Being able to challenge for five and also gain lore while doing so, that seems fantastic in the lore races that tend to happen late, so we wanted to try him out. Only played him a few times, but he performed really well when he was out, so kind of neat to see it in this deck. Not sure it'll stick around in Thomas's list, but uh, yeah. So there you are, some great notes from a very good pilot of this deck. All right, let's move into the top four. Before we go into the top four, it's the obligatory like and subscribe pitch. If you're enjoying this video and you like Lurkana content, go ahead and like this video and subscribe to our channel and keep up with what we're doing. We're having a lot of fun. Here we have an aggro list on steroids. This is a turquoise deck run by Dan Ward III. What can I say about this deck? It is fast. It's consistent. I played against it. It keeps you on the edge of your seat. This deck performed really well all day. The only deck it lost to was an Amethyst Emerald deck, and watching Dan pile this deck was just fantastic. I will highlight a couple things for those not familiar with this list. What this is designed to do is get characters on the board early and to keep putting high lore characters on the board. You generally have a one drop every game, and then you're putting down ideally Flynn Rider or Aurora on turn two. The other thing I'll note in these lists is that they have nothing higher than ink five. What these decks are designed to do is get you to five ink and then you just stay there and just keep dropping whatever you draw onto the board to get lore as fast as possible. This deck will win fast. I did run into a few of Dan's opponents throughout the day who were blinking in shock that they lost two games in the span of 15 minutes. Um, this deck is, is just good. I do think one thing you see in this list that you don't see in some other turquoise decks is the Mickey Mouse Detective, because it doesn't really add a lot to the to the lore rush, and this deck really isn't a ramp deck. It's designed to get a lot of lore quickly. So I did ask Dan about this, about how well Mickey was performing, and he said uh, it's not necessarily his best third turn drop, but what it does allow him to do is drop one of his five drops on turn four. So getting out of Cusco, getting out of Mad Hatter, getting out of Maleficent Uninvited on turn four oftentimes is just a game ender. And so when he can drop Mickey to get that extra ink um, and ramp into one of those five drops, it's just fantastic. And he said it performed really well for him. And also for a competitive deck, it's also very affordable. I think the list of singles is coming in at about $160, which is definitely on the low end. So if you're looking for a deck to compete with without breaking the bank, this is one that you can definitely check out. For those interested in a deck like this, head over to the YouTube channel First to 20. They did a couple in-depth videos on a list like this. Moving on to the top four, we have Aaron Rubin's Steel Song list. 
Now this is the second Amber skill deck we've seen in the top eight, but it's very different from the list that we saw before. This is one of the reasons that I think Amber Steel is really popular right now, because this deck plays very differently than the one we saw Ivan pilot. Ivan's deck did not run Lanterns or a whole new world and this one does. So although in the meta right now, we see a lot of these Amber Steel decks popping up all over the place in the top four and the top eight, oftentimes they're very different decks. There are some consistencies with the Rapunzel's, Grab Your Swords, of course, Aerial Singer is gonna be in there. Big Tank is a staple. But other than that, there's a lot of other pieces that rotate around. So if you like playing Amber Steel, take a look at this list, take a look at Ivan's list, tinker around with each one and see which one you like better. Both perform very well today. Next in the top four is a deck that I was really excited to see in the top eight. This is Hal Brady's Amber Sapphire deck. Hal really played this deck well today. He was one of several people who traveled three hours down from Dallas to beat up on us Austinites, along with Dan Ward and Bobby Brake in the top eight. Now I wasn't playing terribly great attention, but I don't think I saw anybody else playing this color combo. Unfortunately, I never got to watch complete games of this deck, so I didn't get to see exactly what it was doing the whole time. I just saw a lot of the end games. I did see Jasmine used very well a few times to heal. Um, the other thing I'll note is Robin Hood's appearance in this list again, um, which again is great for card draw, and we're seeing more and more evasives pop up in some of these green and red decks, and so being able to knock them out on your turn with Robin Hood is great. Overall, this is a list that I want to try, and I'm really sad that I didn't get to play against Hal at any point during the day. And finally, rounding out the top four is Amethyst Emerald, a list that I love. I just love this deck. It's a ton of fun to play, and I have a lot to say about it. So first, credit where credit is due. I actually tinkered around with this deck list a lot, and ended up settling on this. This is a list used by Gareth Shaw, who finished third in Sanctuary Gaming Center's Grand Tournament in September, and I ran the same list here today. Now, I do consider this an aggro deck, although it's not as fast as the Turquoise deck that we saw before. A little bit slower, but it does have a lot more to offer late game. By far, the MVP of this deck is Kuzco. Anybody who's played against him knows what a pain he is, and I think there's a reason that you see it rising in prices on the secondary market. Everybody wants him. He's just fantastic. He helps you race early, and he helps you finish games late. One thing I will note with Kuzco, Kuzco, to me, is probably the best thing you can drop after a Be Prepared. Um, oftentimes, when you're playing against Ruby and they're building up for that board wipe, they are holding other removal in their hand, or an Elsa to slow you down after a Ruby player plays Be Prepared, Kuzco is the last thing that they want to see, because all the other answers that they have in their hand can't deal with him. In three separate games, I bounced a turn five Kuzco back to my hand with Genie, leaving an evasive on the board, so that I had Kuzco in my hand as a threat after Be Prepared, and it worked well every single time. The other thing I like about this deck is the evasives. Oftentimes you can race ahead, but then your opponent gains control of the board. Having cards like Pascal, Peter Pan, and Tinkerbell allow you to close out the game with cards that they can't challenge. I will say for underperformers, John Silver, I inked every single game. There was never a scenario where I was at the end of the game and thought John Silver was a valuable play. I'm honestly considering switching out John Silver for Mother Gothel and giving that a try, because it can lock down a lot of aggro decks if you can get to turn six. I don't know, it is one card that never hit the board for me today. The last thing I'll say is Jasper. Jasper was another critical card in this deck. On any aggro deck, I'm mulliganing as much as I can in order to get a Jasper in my hand because it's the only thing that can slow down Turquoise, and in a mirror match against Ruby Amethyst, it's probably the only thing that'll slow that down as well. Jasper's just a fantastic turn play three play against aggro. You want him every single time. If anybody has any questions about piloting this deck, let me know in the comments, and I'll answer them as best I can. But one thing I will say with a little asterisk is I never played against a Steel deck, and that's probably the matchup that this deck is worst against. Overall, this was a fantastic event with a really diverse top eight. I was really excited to play in it. If you have any questions, let us know down below, and I'm sure I can reach out to some of these players if you have any questions about their specific builds. If you're a casual player who has never played in a tournament, go ahead and give it a try. I think you'll have more fun than you think you will. Everybody I played today was super nice and super gracious, and it was just overall a wonderful experience. So that's it for this tournament. Sign off, catchphrase.